behind the award-winning documentary, She. Welcome to She Goes by Jane on Evergreen Podcasts. I'm your host, author, and poet, Amy Baker. And I'm Vanessa Ciccarelli, photographer and independent filmmaker. At the end of this episode and every episode, we will be joined by a special guest who will read an original poem by Amy Baker about the woman we are featuring. This episode features actor Erica Wong. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, Amy. And hi, everyone listening. Welcome to our very first episode of She Goes by Jane. Now, Vanessa, do you actually know what our first episode is about? I think so. It's about the Long Island serial killer, right? A little yes, a little no. So you're partially correct. Since we're a victim-centered true crime podcast, we are going to talk about the Long Island serial killer a little bit, but only in terms of a theory of what happened to an unidentified Jane Doe who was found in 2013. Okay. So it could be a victim, but we're going to be talking of his, but we are going to be talking about the the case itself. Yeah. So like we're going to see this as Long Island as kind of like a, a beginning point. Okay. Okay. So we're going to start in this very small town. It is like three square miles called Latting Town. Um, we had all these like issues with trying to figure out how to say this town name. And um, eventually we, we got Vanessa's husband to call the town hall to find out how to say this. So if we are wrong, Long Islanders blame their, their town. We're sorry. We're sorry. This town is very small and it's on the Long Island Sound, so the northern part of Long Island. This is considered a very exclusive part of Long Island, kind of like called the North Shore. It's sometimes called the Gold Coast because there's a lot of wealthy people who live along this part of Long Island. Okay. Okay, so we're going to a very specific part of this very, very small town. It's at the end of this dead end road called Sheep Lane. Okay. It's not like farm area, though. No. No, it's just called that. Okay. No. I mean, I suspect at one point this area was farmland because things are named after a lot of farm animals in this okay. area. Okay. Okay. I just, I just thought of good because you were like, it's it's like the more expensive area, but it also has this farming name. So I was just like, are we in a city? Wait, just so I can get it kind of in my head. Um, are we? Is it like city-ish or is it a little bit rural? So like Sheep Lane itself is goes through like marshland. And so if you okay. look on both sides, that's kind of what's on both sides of it. And at the end of it is an exclusive country club, like beach club. Okay. And then there's an unnamed road, like a private road that goes off to the left where there are really expensive houses. Okay. So it's not super densely populated here. No, I don't get the sense. No, that. okay, okay, just so I... Yeah, I get the sense that it's wealthy landowners who are, have some room okay. to themselves. So on January 21st, 2013, at around 3 p.m., there's a woman who is walking her dog along the beach. And the dog goes off trail and starts digging in the sand. What does she find? <laughs> um, she, well, the dog finds a bag of some sort and so she moves the bag a little bit to try to see what's going on and inside is the skeletal remains of a woman okay this goes back to like remember we were talking about that article last week about how like so many bodies are found by dogs so when you went there i was like oh a dog a dog a dog is gonna find something and they did and they did okay yeah that's yeah so the Police come out, and um, there's not, I, I need to emphasize, there is not a lot that we know about this woman who is found. We are going to refer to her as Laddingtown Jane Doe, just to kind of separate her from other Jane Doe's found in the area. Um, she was found in Nassau County, so there are other people who call her Nassau County Jane Doe, but um, there are other Jane Doe's. Okay. Inside is human bones, women's slacks, undergarments. Police determine, they say in some places that she's between the ages of 20 and 30, but in the um, NamUs, the National Database for Missing and Unidentified Persons, she's listed up to age 50. Okay. 
So police have kept a lot of information about her under wraps. There's not a lot that is talked about with her specifically. They say that there are obvious signs of trauma to her body, her skeletal remains, but they don't say what. They don't say exactly what her body is wrapped in. This is important for later, so we're going to okay. pin that and come back to it. Although in the database, they do say it's a garbage bag. Okay. The most notable thing on her is a 24 karat gold necklace with a pig as its little charm. Okay. The woman is of Asian descent. And so police believe that she might be Chinese or even Korean. They're not sure, but they emphasize that the year of the pig, if we're going by that, is corresponds to birth years of 1995, 1983, and 1971. Okay. Yeah. It's one of the things I thought about when you said pig and then possibly Asian. Yeah. Okay. So... They do say that it looks like her body was intentionally buried and that she's been there for a while because there are vegetation roots that are growing in through the bag. Okay. And that she was there before Hurricane Sandy. The area that she was found in was underwater, but they don't believe it was like kind of transferred in there during Hurricane Sandy. They believe she was intentionally buried. Okay. Okay. So, like I said, this is, like, an exclusive kind of area with very expensive houses. And the thing that I find interesting is that, of course, like, everyone that they interviewed about this, like, neighbors and that sort of thing, just sort of expressed, like, shock that it could happen there. It can happen anywhere. It can happen everywhere. And I do think that this is extremely intriguing because... In 2005, so like not too many years earlier, like what, eight years earlier, there was a woman who was, her body was found outside of this really expensive house called Land's End. Land's End was like the house that maybe The Great Gatsby is based on. Oh, really? Yeah. And that's right there too. That's right there. It's like, it's on that private road. So it shouldn't be that surprising. Right. So this unidentified lady was found. She goes unidentified for a few days until they find out she was murdered by her boyfriend and dumped there. So her name is Elizabeth Parisi. And she doesn't have any bearing on this story, but I just kind of want to set the scene that, like, this is is something that happens there. Right. So one of the things the police do immediately is they contact Suffolk County, which is their bordering county, to let them know that they found this body because there's some theories that this could be part of a serial killer situation. Okay, and what makes them think it's a serial killer situation? So, as you pointed out at the start of the episode when we were talking about, like, is this about the Long Island serial Mm -hmm. killer? This is in the same time range as most of the investigation into the Long Island serial killer is, like, really turning around. Okay, so would this have been just, like, the first one in this area and that's they're connecting it to others around that area like farther away or yeah so her body is found on the north side of long island and previously they have found a bunch of bodies in this area known as gilgo beach which is on the south side of the island okay so they're just connecting that now yeah so we're about 38 miles distance from where gilgo beach is to the north side okay that's not that far And it's not that far. Okay, it's closer than I was thinking. Yeah. So when we're talking about theories about, like, who is this woman and what might have happened to her, uh, one of the theories is, is she connected to the Long Island serial killer? Now, I think one of the important things to note is that one of the suspects in the Gilgo Beach killings slash Long Island serial killer has recently been arrested. But in keeping with kind of our practice, we are not saying his name. Okay. And it's one of the suspects? One of the suspects. I did not realize there was more than one thing going on. Right. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to note that, I don't know, I, Long Islanders, we need to talk. Like, what is going on? Why are there so many serial killers? So there are more than one and they all just get lumped under the name Long Island Serial Killer? Is that what I'm... Right. Okay. So there was a man in 
the late 80s, who was originally known as the Long Island serial killer, who killed anywhere from 9 to 17 people. Oh, wow. And was arrested and convicted in is actually being housed in Clinton Correctional, which is the Ew, maximum yeah. security prison near us. Okay. Yeah. So, but we're going we're gonna to pause on that because I think setting up, because... They're... Right, I'm just feeling at this point, like, the term Long Island serial killer is very loose. Yes. It's just serial killer in Long Island. S serial killers in Long Island. In Long Island. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, one of the theories is that the man who was just arrested, who is known as the Long Island serial killer, Lisk, the Gilgo Beach killer, could have done something that was connected to this woman, Laddingtown, Jane Doe. Okay. So I exist and live in the world of true crime. So in my world, like, of course, everyone knows about the Long Island serial killer. Right. <laughs> um, but actually, like, there are some people on Long Island who don't even know that this is going on. So we're going to kind of cover briefly, as briefly as possible, the Lisk concept as as maybe a potential theory for what happened to or Jane Doe. Okay. Okay. So we're going to go back in time and talk about um, the women who were found on Gilgo Beach. And it's a lot of people. So 11 total. On one, on that one beach. Kind of. It's, it's kind of like it starts in Gilgo Beach and then kind of goes up Ocean Parkway a good ways as they expanded their investigation. Uh, and this is over a long time period or... Um, they're found within a few months of each other. Okay, that's a lot. That is a lot. So we're, we start this story um, with a woman named Shannon Gilbert, who's 24 years old. She's working as a sex worker, and she gets a client call out to Long Island. Her driver brings her out there. Now, it's important to note that, like, having a driver is, like, fairly typical of a lot of sex workers working out of New York City. It adds protection, gives them transportation, etc. So they go out to this area of Long Island, and she goes to this client's house. The client calls in her driver a few hours later and is like, hey, you need to take her home. Okay. And he goes in, and she is is having like a, I don't know, a panic attack of some sort. She is, is hyper concerned. The client is trying to get her to leave. And this is all going down. So Shannon calls 911. And you can actually hear the 911 tapes now. They've been released recently-ish. And she immediately is panicked on this 911 call. Like she is asking for help. Um, she wants out. Okay, so she's she's on this 911 call for about 20-something minutes. And police do not respond to her call because she never, never says where she is. Does she even say what happened? No. She just expresses that she feels like she's in danger. She's asking for help. She seems to run away from her driver. She runs away from the client's house. And she shows up at a neighbor's house at around 5.20 a.m. And she's knocking on the door and asking for help. He calls police. And she panics from there and she runs away again, ends up at another neighbor's house. That person also calls 911. So they're getting like multiple 911 calls about Shannon. When the police finally arrive, it's 5.40 a.m. and Shannon is nowhere to be found. Okay. So they just theorized pretty immediately that like she must have gotten into the car with the man that they saw with her who probably would have been her driver okay and that she's just left the area and they kind of like close it from there okay it's kind of sad and disturbing that we don't know what happened there but her family knows that she's missing police don't really seem to be active on this so her family comes down and really starts pressing people to try to figure out like what happened to shannon so this happens in May of 2010, and really kind of it's on hold, but we know she's missing. And finally, 
in December, December 11th, an officer decides he's going to go kind of check it out. So he walks along the beach with his trained canine, Blue, who's who's trained to, like, find bodies. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, he's using it as a training exercise for Blue. He's like, I already have to do this training anyway. I might as well actually look for an actual person. So they're walking on this beach. They discover a body wrapped in burlap along the beach. The body is not buried. It's kind of in the brush wrapped up. So immediately the suspicion is that he has found Shannon. Right. Did he? No. It's not Shannon. It's not Shannon. Okay. No. It takes several months to identify who it is, but they know pretty immediately it's not Shannon because Shannon has a titanium plate in her jaw. Okay. So, and this body did not. This woman is eventually identified as Melissa Barthelme, who is 24. She was also a sex worker, and she disappeared July 12th, 2009. She told a friend she was meeting a client and disappeared. Okay. So, this, yeah. It's feeling targeted, right? At this point, like... At this point. So, girls we have, are... Yeah. Yeah. We have Shannon, who is a sex worker. We have Melissa, who is also... So two days later, police go back out to Gilgo Beach where that body was found. And in succession, they find three more bodies wrapped in burlap. That's horrifying. Completely horrifying. They're all about the same distance away from the parkway. They're like 22 to 33 feet away from the parkway, all kind of in the brush on the beach. Okay. The next day, police are like, we have a serial killer. Yeah. There's a situation happening there. There's a situation. So it takes a while to identify these bodies, but after time, they first in January announced that one is Megan Waterman, who's 22. She was a sex worker okay. who went missing June 6, 2010. A little bit later, they announced that they've identified Melissa Barthelme, who we mentioned earlier, Amberlyn Costello, 27, who went missing on September 2nd, 2010, and Maureen Brainerd Barnes, 25, who went missing July 9th, 2007. Okay. Are they also all sex workers? All sex workers. Now, you mentioned earlier that a lot of the sex workers have a driver. Mm -hmm. mm, there were no drivers reporting any of these women missing? So some have drivers, some have family members, a good number were reported missing. So it's just... They were. Okay. Yeah. These four women collectively become known as the Gilgo Four because they have all the same characteristics. They're wrapped in burlap in the same location and found at the same time. The other thing that they have in common is Melissa, Amber, and Maureen are all just like really tiny women. So they're all under five feet. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they weigh about the same. They're all about like 100 pounds. So really petite women. Megan is kind of an outlier at being like 5'5". Five, five. Okay. That's strange because it sounds like whoever was calling on these girls was actually profiling smaller girls. For for what reason? Like it just sounds so crazy so, to me. Like we're, so we're trying specific. to have these women that are easier to control. Like it's just it's, – it sounds really terrifying, especially as a smaller woman myself. It's like, oh – that's gross. Right. So all of all of them as well advertise pretty regularly on Craigslist, which was also a pretty common practice in this era to advertise on Craigslist. Okay. Like secretly. And sizes and that are put on there? Yeah. So like sometimes women would post photos of themselves. Sometimes they would post like kind of characteristics about themselves. Okay. So it's like a side note. It seems really gross. Like you don't feel like you have the ability to handle somebody a little bit bigger, so you're wanting to pick on the smallest one. It's really gross. Yeah. So police then go back out to the Gilgo Beach area in March of 2011. They're back out there, kind of seeing what else they can find. They find the partial remains of a woman less than a mile away from where the Gilgo Beach 4 were found. They label her Jane Doe number five. And she's connected. Is she? Possibly. So one huge difference between her and the four is that they are able to DNA link these 
remains back to a woman who was found previously in 2003. So they find partial remains in 2003 in Manorville, Long Island, and partial remains on the beach. Okay. Yes. I don't like this story. It's not. I mean, none of our stories are going to be. No, none of them are pleasant. This one's extra uncomfortable. This one is extra uncomfortable. Those partial remains were previously identified as Jessica Taylor, who was 20 when she went missing in July of 2003. Um, She was also doing sex work when she went missing. Okay. Now, Jessica Taylor, some reports state that she, her remains were wrapped in garbage bags, but one of her connections said that police had told him that she was wrapped in burlap. Which seems more likely, given everything else happening, right? But Possibly. maybe not. Possibly? Okay. We're going to... We, so we're just speculating we're here. Speculating. We don't know. No. Okay. No. And we have we have a ways to go. On April 4th, 2011, they find three more bodies in the Oak Beach, Gilgo Beach kind of stretch. One of them is named Jane Doe number 6. And they also found a toddler girl and an Asian male dressed in women's clothing. Now, I want to, like, take a little bit of a moment to say I don't know how this person would identify in life and what their existence is. So, Right. We don't know their pronouns. We don't know their pronouns. Okay. Yeah. So Jane Doe number six is eventually identified as Valerie Mack, 24, who went missing in 2000. Some of her remains were found in Manorville, the same place as Jessica Taylor in 2000. Okay. I don't know why this person is doing this, the dividing of the remains. Yes, there's. it's really disturbing. Definitely that happening. Yeah. Um, they don't identify her until 2020. So she is known as Jane Doe number six for quite a few years. On April 11th, police go back out again and find victims 9 and 10. They're now about five miles out from the Gilgo 4. One of these is known as Peaches for her peach tattoo. She had previously, part of her had been discovered in 1997 elsewhere. Okay. And then they found part of her remains on the beach. And what year are we at now? 2011. 2011. That's a tremendous amount of time. Yes. They also are able to genetically link her to the toddler. So she is the mother of the toddler. Okay. Yeah. The other set of remains, who the woman who becomes known as Jane Doe number seven, she's genetically linked to partial remains of a woman who was discovered in 1996 on Fire Island. And so she's known as Fire Island Jane Doe starting in 1996, um, and then they find the rest of her remains on this beach. And she was actually just identified in the last month. And her name is Karen Vergata, and she was 34 when she went missing in 1996. She was also a sex worker. Okay. So it's not until one year after the police find the Gilgo 4 that they find Shannon's purse and phone in an area known as Oak Beach in Marshland. Two days later, and about a quarter mile from where her person phone were found, they find her body. Okay. Police pretty much say immediately that her death is an accidental death and not... Even with all the things leading up to it, they're feeling like that? Yeah, her family definitely does not believe this, but the police have labeled her death accidental. Okay. And I mean, maybe from their point of view, she if if something was happening and she was having like a strong panic attack, maybe she could have ended up in some marshland. Yeah, in some marshland somehow accidentally. Right. Like there's there's lots of reasons why that like, you know, theory works or does not work. Right. But like there's definitely divided thought on like what happened to Shannon that night. Right. It's hard to rule out just like a panic attack stemming from nothing. It's almost easier, especially in this area, to believe that something else went wrong. Right. So, you know, all of this is happening in, like, the bodies are being found, you know, in 2010 and 2011. And so the investigation is clearly leaning towards a serial killer situation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we're in this time period, but, you know, we're currently in 2023 and suspect has just been arrested. 
Um, so the case kind of goes cold largely because there is like massive issues with the investigating police department. There's like corruption issues, there's leadership issues. And so those kinds of things go on hold for a long time. Okay. But we're now in new leadership, new investigation practices, and they hone in again on trying to figure out who might be connected to these cases. There are divided thoughts. Like, you know, one theory is like all of these women that I just mentioned are a person. And then there's other people who believe that there are several serial killers involved, particularly due to differences in how bodies are found. Okay. Well, I could see that because we're talking about possible burlap, possible garbage bags, and then entire people as opposed to partial remains. Right. Right. So. Yeah. So. I don't know. I don't, I don't know enough about serial killers to know how much they mix up what they're doing. Yeah. Like. Yeah. What their MO is. Exactly. Like what, why are they doing what they're doing? I don't know. Yeah. So in 2023, a few things happen. One is that one of Amber Costello's connections back in the day, he said that one of her clients drove a Chevy Avalanche. This detail was not investigated, even though he said that he believed that Amber went with the same man who drove the Chevy Avalanche the time that she disappeared. Okay, it was Amber one of the, the four? Yes, the Amber's one of the four. Okay. So police then pull records for Chevy Avalanches. They get the name of the man who's now been arrested. Okay. They also do over 300 subpoenas for phone, internet, credit cards, etc. Because one of the things that Long Island serial killer slash Gilgo Beach killer did is call family members of the Gilgo Four. He called them? Yes. Who does that? Messed up serial killers. I'm disliking this person, obviously, but more and more and more and more and more mm -hmm. on so many levels. When they arrested him, part of the arrest records also include some of his searches. He searched for podcasts about him. He, mm. Mm -hmm. mm -mm. he searched the names and family members' names of the the Gilgo Four. He also searched for their children. That's disgusting. What is he calling them and saying? Is he saying anything when he calls them? So he only called, only called a few times. Um, some of them are like threatening, like you'll be next. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he really wants to be known for whatever this is that he's trying to do. Right. I mean, he searched himself multiple times too. He's gross. Extremely. So he is only charged with three out of the four of the Gilgo Four murders. He's not currently charged in Maureen's murder. I'm not sure. He will be, though? I would. I'm wondering if there's, like, clear connections between him and the three, and they don't want to jeopardize the case by adding in the fourth, even though, like, he's the suspect okay. in that one. Like, clearly they're all connected because they're right. found in the same place in the same manner. Same kind of threatening phone calls, etc. But currently not charged in hers. Whether or not we'll see one in the near future. Right. Yeah. Considering it's happening right now, it's hard to say anything. Yeah. But like, you know, with Megan, one of the Gilgo four, his hair was found on her body and they were able to DNA connect him initially because like he threw out some pizza crusts. Oh, okay. And they like nabbed his pizza crusts and tested them for DNA. They did well. They did well. So there are some reasons that we might want to include Laddingtown, Jane Doe, or not. One is that she is like 38 miles away from those Gilgo Four that we know are connected to this man. Okay. To add a little bit more to the mix, we also have a woman who could be included in this or not. Her Jane Doe name is Cherries for okay. a cherry tattoo that she has. And she was found like six miles away from where Laddingtown Jane Doe was found. Okay. So on the northern part of Long Island. So she's sometimes known as Cherries or Mutton Town Jane Doe. And she was found in a suitcase in 2001. So her remains were found in a suitcase. Mm -hmm. Can you remind me again what the first woman was found in? 
So Laddington Jane Doe, our subject for today, she was found in a bag. Some of those say that it was a garbage bag and other places like refuse to mention what material that bag was. Okay. So we don't know if it's a similar bag yet. Or... Right. Okay. So, But not a suitcase. But not a suitcase. So there are some arguments that because the Gilgo Four were so similar in appearance that this man who was just arrested, Lisk, didn't necessarily have anything to do with some of the other people found on the beach because there are differences in terms of race, for instance. So peaches and cherries are black women. We have the Asian male who was found. Um, we have Laddingtown Jane Doe, who's of Asian descent. But in his court documents, where they release some of his searches, which I can't, I'm not even going to get into here because just they're disgusting what his search terms were. But he clearly looked for porn that involved both black and Asian participants. Okay. And the four that were found, are they what? The four are all like white women of similar-ish build. Okay. So he's not Google searching white women. Yeah, he has four tiny white women that are attributed oh, he, to him. Oh, he definitely searched white women as well. Oh, he just searched all women. Yeah, he was he was definitely looking at a lot of torture porn. Okay. But some of his search terms were specific to black women, Asian male search terms. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So is Laddingtown Jane Doe connected to him? Is he connected to more of the people who are found? Is he just connected to the four? The story is really still developing there. Right. One of the other theories is that Laddingtown Jane Doe could be connected to a different killer. We can't actually call him a serial killer because he's only been convicted of two murders and not more. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about him so we can kind of hone in on this theory. Okay. Interestingly, like Lisk, he is a married father of two. Mm. This guy is a carpenter. He has been convicted of two murders. He is from Manorville, which, if you remember, is where Jessica Taylor and Valerie Mack were partially found. Okay, yes. So he lives in that town. Okay. He was convicted of the murders of Rita Tangretti and Colleen McNamee. Rita was 31 and she was found in 1993 and Colleen was 20 and she was found in 1994. Both were sex workers. Both Rita and Colleen were strangled with blunt force trauma to the head. Their bodies were mutilated in in a way that seems intentional to hide their identities and they were found in wooded areas and they were found about nine miles apart. This man was arrested in 2014. So quite... A bit of time passed between 1994 and 2014. Mm -hmm. They went missing in 1994. Yeah. But they were only found in 2003 and he was arrested in, in 2014. Yeah. So what was he doing the rest of the time, Vanessa? Well, also, it's just like we have a huge amount of women going missing and we're going to do this very slowly. Yeah. So that more can go missing yeah. in the meantime. Is this like facilitating the quantity of missing women? Well, yeah. I mean, I think that there's... You know, a lot of conversations about, and we're going to discuss this on our podcast quite a bit, how sex workers are targeted by killers and how they are also at the same time ignored by policing agencies. And most of the world. And most of the world. Yeah. In fact, there's a term called the missed missing, which is when people go missing, but they are not reported missing and how often that corresponds with people who also work in the sex industry. It's sad that there's different values placed on different people depending on what they do. Exactly. So we have this huge gap of time between the times Rita and Colleen are murdered and the time he is arrested. He is arrested because his brother had violated an order of protection and part of that was having to enter his DNA into a system and that's actually how they found him through a... So they found it through his brother's DNA and then it went over to him? Yeah. And they were like, oh, wait a minute. You match the DNA that we found on these two women. So he is suspected in the third murder of Sandra Castilla or Castilla. Not sure of the pronunciation, but not charged for that. 
but he is convicted and sentenced to two consecutive 25 years to life. And he is also in Clinton Correctional mm. Facility. Lucky us. The maximum security prison near us. Along with the other guy who used to be known as the Long Island serial killer. So we have two, two of them. Long Island serial killers. Yes. Yeah. Well, he, he, I guess he's not a serial killer because he's not been convicted of. I feel like he is. So let's just, <laughs> let's just go there. <laughs> you just want to go there? After the sentencing, the assistant district attorney for Suffolk County, Robert Biancaville, he says that he believes that this man that we're currently talking about must be connected to at least some of the victims found along Gilgoat Beach. He doesn't say who, but I'm personally wondering if he means Jessica Taylor and Valerie Mack specifically. Right. Yeah. It feels like that. Now, Valerie Mack is found practically next to the body of the toddler that is the child of peaches. Could that just be a coincidence? It could be because like... Because they're both just... using the same area. Yeah, it's like body after body. You know, we, we've got we've got Valerie and Jessica, you know, being found in the same town that this guy lived in. Like the, the notion that he just killed two people in the 90s and then just like stopped... Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I can't accuse someone without, you know, there being right. like clear evidence, but. Yeah. But accusing for somebody who's already been proven to have done some is not like accusing someone who's innocent either, right? Well, yeah, but like, you know, at, at this point, they're all just theories, right? Okay. Yeah. Like, I have some sneaky suspicions given all the details, but. Yeah. So I, I think it's interesting that. We have this situation in which Gilgo Beach and this stretch along Ocean Parkway just became like a dumping ground for woman after woman. Mm -hmm. All of these women, particularly because they worked in the sex industry. Now, some of the women were still yet unidentified. So Peaches and Cherry, Laddingtown, Jane Doe, the Asian male. Are they sex workers? There's no evidence and police really aren't saying. Until we know who they are, we might not be able to connect those dots. Okay. So those are the two, you know, prominent theories about what might have happened to Laddingtown Jane Doe. And of course, you know, to introduce like the other possibility is that, or other possibilities is like, is there a, another serial killer involved? Or is this a like one time murder situation? Right. And you said there was the other woman that was found outside the Great Gatsby-ish house. Yeah. And that was a- Years before yeah. the Laddingtown- Jane Doe was discovered, right? Yeah, and that was a domestic violence situation where he specifically targeted his his partner and murdered her. Okay. Okay, you just went through a lot of stuff with us, Amy. Like, a lot. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is just not sitting well with me. Like, I mean, we're talking a five-mile stretch of beach with this many individuals found on it. I mean... We're talking probably less than a five-minute walk from body to body. And then there's the part where part of them are only partial remains, which I've never heard of in my life and I will probably have nightmares about for the rest of my life. Um, and then also the targeting of these tiny women. Like, do we know anything more about that part? Or do we know how – actually, do we know how tall our Laddingtown Jane Doe is? Was she also a tiny woman? So um, some of the interesting things about Laddingtown Jane Doe is that there is actually very little information available about her. Now, I don't know if police are keeping some of those details like quiet and private. Usually what happens, even with skeletal remains, there'll be like some estimation of height and there is not one listed for her. There isn't. Okay. No. Maybe just because there's so many things going on, they're trying to keep it under wraps until they get things solved. Is that how... That would normally happen? It's hard to tell. Okay. Is this like a move for them to keep things pretty quiet while they kind of investigate internally? Which does happen. We all know like a lot of information based on what's been released, but please know a lot more, right? right. Or alternately, the other thing is that because she is specifically an Asian woman, what happens is she falls into a, a racial category that is not as 
investigated or looked into. So we're going to talk more this season about missing white women um, and how they kind of get more attention than women of color. And as an Asian woman is part of what is happening is less attention to her case because of her race. Okay. So less based on race, less based on occupation. There's a lot of things that could potentially lead to less attention. Yeah. So we're, we're going to be dealing with a lot of like intersectionality here. So was she involved in the, the sex industry? I don't know. A lot of the Jane Does that we talked about today and also the women who've been identified like war. So it's possible, but we don't know. But we don't know. And you know, like the, one of the interesting things that I find is that like, we do know quite a bit about the man who's been arrested for the Gilgo Four murders. And earlier you, you brought up the size of the women because they are quite petite. And he is like a big man. He is. Oh, he is big. He is big. He is. See, right away, I think you're targeting tiny women because you're tiny and weak. No. So he is over six foot, 200 and something pounds. Like he's a So it makes big it guy. even more horrific than what I was thinking of just the story of weakness. And... Right. I mean, a lot, again, I don't want to get like too involved into his search history. Right. But a lot of the, the search terms that he did use are words like girls. And it, it does seem like he was looking for young people in terms of pornography. So there's kind of that angle too. So he's attaching the size maybe to the age almost in his head? Maybe he targeted okay. petite women. But we again, we don't know until more of that story develops. But, you know, he is like an imposing kind of guy. So he's he's not slight in any means. Very much just a dominance thing, obviously. Yeah, there's some, something going on there. Something, yeah. So now what what are the hopes of identifying our Laddingtown Jane Doe? Like what, what would be the next things you, you think might be? Yeah. happening there you know if you had asked me like a few years ago about like the progress in identifying jane does like i'd be pretty cynical about it one thing is is you can see over time that a lot of the jane does that you know or the women who were once jane does in the scenarios that we just talked about they have been identified you know even with the one um karen being identified recently in the last month. So I do have hope that like we're not in a situation in which she will go unnamed for a long time. Whether or not they use something like genetic genealogy where they're able to use her ancestral connections to make identifications, I'm not sure, but I hope that something like that happens so that she can be identified sooner rather than later. Right. Hope that happens. It seems like like a good time for that to happen with all of the attention these cases seem to be getting again right now because of that arrest. Right. The arrest has brought a lot of attention back to Long Island and really it had kind of fizzled out. You know, they found all those bodies in a, a short expanse of time which means that a lot of people missed those stories. They didn't hear about it. And so hopefully with his arrest and as things progress, the attention is back there and there's some movement on identifying the rest of the individuals that are unidentified. Now we are going to listen to Amy's poem, Our Bodies, the Ocean, read by Erica Wong. Erica Wong is a ballet dancer and actress who made her Broadway debut in The King and I, before traveling to the U.S. with the first national Broadway tour of An American in Paris, and was part of the original cast of 2018's revival of M. Butterfly. Recently, she performed as Meg in The Phantom of the Opera and has taken on television roles for shows like CBS's NCIS Hawaii and NBC's New Amsterdam. Our Bodies, the Ocean Unidentified Woman Discovered January 23rd 2013 in Laddingtown, New York. They are looking for women down at Gilgul Beach, bodies wound tight with burlap. Deep in the rushes they find a man, the small frame of a child, and woman. So many women they could form a choir, these saints of the last days. It takes more years to find me. My bones drenched beneath hurricane sand and the filmy light of Oyster Bay. 
So deep in the shore I must cast my body toward fate. But don't believe there is luck in wearing a charm for those born during the year of the pig. The final sign of those easily fooled into believing it is anything other than a way for water to collect along its curved back and beneath its golden hooves. For more information about our show or to check out other shows on the network, please visit evergreenpodcast.com. Bye, Vanessa. Bye, Amy.